Did you know that the Philippines attempted to invade Malaysia? But it backfired badly and it ended up with decades of rebellions in the Philippines. What exactly happened? Let's learn more. Mabuhay or in kapampangan, luwid kayo. Welcome back to my channel. It's Mika Biaralyo, your friendly Pinoy historian. And if you are new to my channel, in this channel, I make videos about our people's history, culture, and everything in between. So if you like learning about any of those things, don't forget to like, share this video, comment down below, and please subscribe. And in today's video, we'll dig deeper and learn more about Operation Merdeka and the truth about the Jabida Massacre. But before we begin, here's a few reminders. I understand that today's topic is complicated and quite controversial. But I do hope that this will help many of you to dig deeper, to learn more and do something productive with that knowledge. So I'll be including a list of credible resources and recommended readings below for those who are genuinely interested to learn more. This video is about learning from what has already been proven and recorded by history. This is not about any propaganda to support certain politicians. This is not about the elections. This is about the history and the struggles of the indigenous Muslim communities of what is now the Philippines. So if you have an open mind and genuinely want to learn more, then this video is for you. So without further ado, let's dig deeper and learn more. Historically speaking, the Philippines has been understood to consist of three distinct major regions, these being Luzon in the north, the many islands of the Visayas in the middle, and in the south, we have Mindanao and the Sulu Archipelago. Significant places where there's a large native Muslim population. But in the post-independence period, a strong belief arose that the Philippines also had a claim to Saba, a vast territory in the northernmost part of the island of Borneo, directly south of the Philippine island of Palawan and just a short boat ride from Sulu. In fact, both Palawan and Saba or North Borneo were once part of the mighty Sultanate of Sulu, one of the most powerful pre-colonial kingdoms in the history of Southeast Asia. And since the Republic of the Philippines was legally the successor state to the Sultanate of Sulu, logically it has claims that this part of Borneo belonged to the Philippines. Saba has been known to be rich in oil deposits right off its coast. And these vast oil deposits had already been detected though not yet exploited by the 1960s. Curiously enough, this was exactly around the same time that the Philippines came under the leadership of its newly elected president and soon-to-be dictator, Ferdinand Edralin Marcos. But let me just clarify that Marcos was not the first Philippine president to begin claiming that Saba was rightfully a Philippine territory. Officially, the claim of the Republic of the Philippines began under President Josdado Macapagal in 1962. Just Dado Mahapagal officially initiated the claim right before the formation of what is now Malaysia in 1963. And interestingly unknown to many, Josdado Mahapagal was actually a direct descendant of the first Sultan of Sulu and the fifth Sultan of Brunei through Mahapagal's own ancestor, Lakandula of Tondo. And also fun fact, long before the Federation of Malaysia was created, the name Malaysia was actually considered by Filipino revolutionaries of the 1800s as a name for an independent Philippines. Filipino revolutionary heroes such as the brilliant Apolinario Mal Bini understood that the freedom of our people was always intertwined with the genuine liberation of what are now Malaysia, the Philippines, and Indonesia. They had hoped that one day, these islands would unite in solidarity, under one banner, and a collective identity and consciousness. But more on this in a future video. And I plan on making separate videos about the claims over Saba in the future. But in the meantime, here's a brief overview of what led to the tragic Jabida massacre. Occur. And as mentioned, the Philippine claim to Saba went back centuries, but the modern manifestation was anchored on a grant from 1878, whereby the Sultan of Sulu granted the use of the region to the British North Borneo Company. Now, this document was written in different languages, and it has long been disputed, with the Philippines claiming that this simply constituted a lease of Saba to the British, while the British claimed that the document granted the region to them in perpetuity. And according to them, this grant in perpetuity theoretically passed down to Malaysia when the 
state was granted independence in 1963. Now, Ferdinand Marcos came to power in 1965 at a time when the Philippines was facing a lot of social and economic crisis. Marcos was seen by many as a hope for the Filipino people. However, once in power, he led a controversial authoritarian government marked by corruption, political persecution, and militarism. The Marcos regime became determined to push the claim to Sabah when he came to power just two years after Malaysia gained its independence. Now, this effort would result in a massacre which would unwittingly backfire and spark an insurgency amongst the Moro people of Mindanao and the neighboring islands of Southern Philippines. Marcos's plan to take control of Sabah from Malaysia was centered on fermenting unrest and chaos in Sabah, aka North Borneo. Now this, in turn, would justify the intervention from the Philippine government. And this whole plan was codenamed Operation Merdeka or Oplan Merdeka. Merdeka means freedom in Bahasa Melayu. Now to this end, in 1967, the Marcos regime began recruiting nearly 200 indigenous Tausug and Sama Bajau people from the southern islands and the provinces of the Philippines known as Sulu and Tawi-Tawi. These young Tausug and Sama Bajau Jiao men would be trained into a commando unit called Jabida. Now to recruit them, they were promised with the benefits and the honor of becoming an elite force in the Philippine military. But unknown to them, the overall intention was to send these Muslim men to Borneo to create unrest in Sabah, which would legitimize Marcos to officially send the Philippine military to Sabah. It is worth noting that during this time, the Republic of the Philippines was more developed. The Philippines during this time had superior military capabilities than the vulnerable younger nation state of Malaysia. In short, the odds were in Marcus's favor. All he needed was official justification. Hence why the covert operation Merdeka was plotted. Now to do this, young Muslim recruits began to be trained by the Philippine military. And at the same time, Army Major Eduardo Martellino, who was in charge of the military operation and who was also a Muslim convert, began to make secret landings in Sabah, in which he and his group of 17 men gathered key information and they tried to convince the Tausug and Sama Bajau people in Sabah to rise up against Malaysia, as there was a large Bangsamoro community in Sabah, mainly from Sulu, Tawi-Tawi, and Mindanao. Now, this plan was proceeding relatively smoothly until early 1968. On the 30th of December 1967, the Muslim recruits upwards of around 180 of them, although the exact figure remains unclear, were transported to Corregidor Island, a small but very historic island in Manila Bay. Now since the time of our pre-colonial ancestors, Corregidor had traditionally been used as a military outpost to protect Manila and Luzon. And it was in Corregidor that the young Muslim men first learned about the true goal of their mission and training. And it was no surprise that the recruits were not happy when they learned the truth. Sabah is a region populated by Muslims and peoples of a similar ethnicity to the Muslims of Southern Philippines. They are closely related to the people of Sulu and Mindanao. In fact, the indigenous people of Sabah and Sulu are blood related to one another. These were all once part of the mighty Sultanate of Sulu. And so, these young Tausug and Sama Bajau men share more of their culture and identity with the people of Sabah than they do with the rest of the Philippines, which by this time has largely been Roman Catholic. And as such, the recruits were disappointed illusioned by the prospects of being sent to Sabah to commit acts of violence against their religious and ethnic kin. They refused to fight and kill their own people, the Tausug and Sama Bajau of Sabah. On top of this, they were also experiencing maltreatment and discrimination from their Philippine military superiors. And more problems began to arise due to the very precarious conditions that the recruits face on the island of Corregidor. From the lack of decent housing to the insufficient and bad food as well as the delays in their payments. So of course, they were also resentful after not receiving any of the benefits or the pay which had been promised to them. It was no surprise that they turned mutinous and restless by March of 1968. They even decided to send a letter to President Marcos on March 2nd, clearly expressing their discontent with the situation. The next day, the authorities appeared on the island and from then on, some of the recruits were sent away while the rest received good food the following days. But the situation soon became alarming and merciless. 
So what exactly happened? How did this end up in, you know, a massacre and decades of rebellion? The following developments led to what became known infamously as the Jabida Massacre. On the 18th of March 1968, the military authorities in Corregidor proceeded to carry out orders that they had received to liquidate the mission. By this, they were meant to kill every single one of the recruits in the Jabida unit. That same night, the men were led out of the barracks in groups of 12. They were brought to a nearby airstrip where they were sadly, tragically, and mercilessly gunned down. And sadly, all of them were killed, except for one recruit, Jibina Rula, who heard the gunshots and ran away. Had he not escaped, the world may never have found out about the Jabina massacre, but he escaped successfully. Jibina Rula vividly remembered what happened, and here is a direct quote from him. As we put down our bags, I heard a series of gunshots. Like dominoes, my colleagues fell. I got scared. I ran and was shot at in my left thigh. I didn't know that I was running towards a mountain. By 8 a.m., I was rescued by two fishermen on Caballo Island near Cavite. And news was soon spreading of the tragic massacre, which the Marcos regime had ordered. And so there was a quick response in places like Manila, where the Moro students from the south protested against the government. But the strongest reaction was in Mindanao, where the public opinion was appalled by the cold blooded killing of scores of their Muslim brethren. Moreover, Mindanao and the Bangsamoro people had a strong reputation for resistance. And this was epitomized by their resistance against colonialism against the Spaniards and the Americans from the 16th to the 20th century. And within weeks of the massacre, further unrest had broken out. The Moro people sought greater independence from Mindanao and the Sulu archipelago in the aftermath of the Jabida massacre. The Muslims felt that they were not represented by the Philippine government, that they were nothing but exploitable and expendable bodies, and that they had no power in a majority Christian nation where crimes against the Muslims went unpunished, where justice for the indigenous people remains elusive. Months later, Congressman Harun al-Rashid Luqman, a highly respected legislator, journalist, and World War II hero from Lanao del Sur was one of those who understood such injustices, and he decided to form the Bangsamoro Liberation Organization. While on the other hand, the governor of Cotabato province, the revered Dato Udtog Matalam, founded the Mindanao Independence Movement. Both of them them and their organizations sought justice and freedom for the Bangsamoro people. However, these groups would not last long and their members would join the Moro National Liberation Front aka the MNLF founded in 1972 by Nur Miswari. And later on, other groups would also emerge such as the Moro Islamic Liberation Front or MILF founded in 1976, and it was the beginning of a long and bloody conflict in the region. And as a response to the unrest and the Bangsamoro movements for self-determination, in the 1970s alone, several more massacres of innocent Muslim communities happened under the Marcos regime in places like Sulu, Maguindanao, Basilan, North Cotabato, Lanao, and Sultan Kudarat. Merciless acts of atrocities such as the Manili Massacre of 19 1971 in North Cotabato, the Palimbang Massacre of 1974 in Sultan Kudarat, the Binkul Massacre in 1977, and the ruthless and massive decimation known as the Burning of Holo in 1974, just to name a few. These conflicts would continue on for decades, with estimates suggesting at least 120,000 people who were killed, including innocent civilians, and at least 2 million people displaced by the violence and around 3 billion US dollars in direct economic loss. And recently, in early 2019, after years of peace negotiations between the Philippine government and groups like the Moro Islamic Liberation Front and the Moro National Liberation Front, an agreement was reached to give sections of Mindanao and nearby islands greater autonomy and freedom within the Philippines. This resulted in the formation of the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region in Muslim Mindanao, effectively devolving many of the 
powers of governance and financial management to the people of the region, powers which traditionally were exercised from Manila. This is much needed to end the militarization of Sulu and Mindanao, and thus the Jabida massacre and the fallout in its aftermath continue to profoundly impact the people of Southern Philippines to the present day. But wait, isn't this just a hoax? Nothing but fake news created by Nino Aquino against Marcos? While it is true that the massacre was revealed to the public by an expose of the late Senator Ninoy Aquino, Ninoy was not the only one who raised the issue of the Jabida massacre. In fact, it was not even Ninoy who Jibin Arula first met after being rescued by the fishermen in Cavite. It was Governor Delphine Montano of Cavite to whom Jibin Arula first narrated the horrors of what he experienced. The events surrounding the massacre have also been well documented by multiple parties. It has also been proven by historians and journalists over the last five decades. Even politicians from different sides agreed that the massacre did happen, that it was not a hoax. In fact, both houses of the Philippine Congress, both the Senate and the House of Representatives, conducted their own independent investigations regarding the massacre. These thorough and meticulous investigations revealed too many inconsistencies to the testimonies of the military. Further Exposing the cover up by the Marcos regime. Sadly, on the other hand, the Marcos government did not even do any comprehensive investigation to prove or dispute the allegations. And instead of cooperating or aiding these independent investigations, these investigations were actually halted upon the orders of Marcos himself. It was also recorded that Marcos pressured the media to cooperate and stop their widespread cover of the massacre investigations. According to the in-depth research by credible historians and highly respected scholars such as Cesar Majul, the Marcos regime actively suppressed the coverage and the documentations relating to the massacre. In other words, Marcos was determined to sweep things under the rug hoping that the stench of such bloody massacre would not seep through the consciousness of the people. To this day, the people of Sulu and Mindanao are continuously facing injustices and violence, with incidents like the recent Mabasapano massacre happening under Aquino's watch in 2015 or the siege of Marawi under Duterte in 2017. We could only hope that the future leaders of the country would sincerely put genuine peace and the well-being of the people at the heart of their policies. It does not really matter whether you hate the Aquinos or support Marcos or vice versa. The Jabida massacre and its aftermath is not really about the feud and rivalry between the Aquino and the Marcos camps. An entire population would not rise up in rebellion just to take sides in a feud between two individuals and their political ambitions. This is not about Aquino versus Marcos. This is about the people of Sulu and Mindanao. The now. This is about seeking justice and struggling to attain peace in a region that has been devastated by a seemingly endless conflict. If we truly want to unite the people, then the first crucial step is to recognize and understand the injustices they faced. You know, just because it does not align with the politicians you chose to vote for, it does not mean that it was simply a hoax. There's a lot of underlying issues and tragic realities beyond the feud between these dead politicians and their children. This is not about them. This is about peace and justice in the Philippines. Denying the massacre and calling it a hoax only adds insult to injury. It does not make anything better, but instead, it's fanning further flames to an already flammable situation. And if you think about it, denying or calling the Jabida massacre a hoax and black propaganda is like saying that the execution of Jose Rizal in Luneta back in 1896 was nothing but a hoax and a black propaganda that the Katipuneros invented to ignite the Philippine Revolution. Regardless of who you're voting for in this upcoming election, the truth remains that the Jabida massacre happened and it has a profound impact in the history and the power 
politics not just of Mindanao but of the Philippines and the entire region of Southeast Asia. We cannot truly attain genuine peace, unity, and justice if many still continue to deny what has already been proven by history. And like what I said in many of my previous videos, the key in ending this age-long conflict in Sulu and Mindanao is not through violence and war but rather through understanding the plight of the people, through understanding the injustices they have endured, and taking the necessary steps towards justice. As Filipinos in this day and age, it is important for us to know and not forget about our own history regardless of our political affiliations. It is equally important for us to recognize and remember such dark episodes of history so that we can all learn from the past, genuinely move forward, and not repeat such oppression, injustices, and violence against any community. Recognizing the injustices done towards generations and millions of exploited people like the indigenous people and Muslim communities of Sulu and Mindanao is a step, a necessary step towards justice. And as I mentioned many times before, without justice, there can be no peace. And that is it for me today. So if you like this video or learn a thing or two, don't forget to like, share this video, comment down below, and please subscribe. You know, help me spread the truth about our people's history and let us genuinely unite and take actions towards peace and justice in our communities. And again, I've included a list, a long list of credible resources and recommended readings about today's topic. So if you really want to learn more, check them out in the links down below. But of course, before we go, today's shout out goes to all our indigenous Taosug and Samabajau people, not just in the Philippines, but also in Borneo and across the seas. And of course, a special shout out to all our Bangsamoro youth who are, you know, doing the hard work, dedicating their lives to lay the foundations for a brighter future and a better society for our people. Isang taos pusong pasasalamat sa inyong lahat. Mabuhay kayo. Dakal pong salamat kaya ko nga luwid kayo. O in bahasa sug, magsukol tuod kay mo. See you next time or in Tagalog kita kits and in Kapampangan, Miki Tiggs and in bahasa sug, balik isab. <laughs>